um, we're going to do a little bit of a recap on last week's initiation sequence. What we're going to do is we're going to do a series of three beta labs. Last week was the first one, the initiation uh, beta lab, where we talked about the different, basically eight things we went through and practiced it. We did a competency on that. This week we're going to progress through initiation to the maintenance phase, and then next week we'll kind of culminate with the termination phase as well. So recapping from last week, initiation phase. When we are getting ready to go on, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna bump up to the cannula. We're gonna check the arterial cannula, right? Then we're going to, uh, we're gonna communicate with the surgeon. He's gonna ask us to go on. We're gonna establish our parameters, like our oxygen, our sweep, thing, our heater cooler on. We're gonna slowly establish venous drainage. We're gonna slowly go on. While we're going on with the roller pump, we're gonna be feeling the tubing. With the centrifugal pump, we're gonna slowly go on making sure there's RPMs, enough to generate forward flow. We are going to turn our purge line on. We're also going to then come up to, to uh, full flow, while at the same time we're gonna turn our le level detector on, our bubble detector on, and our timer on. All at the same time we're watching and slowly creating a seamless transition for that. We talked about at the, at the last lab and then also this last week, there's a, a real close group of similarities between aviation and perfusion. Justin, the two most common times when an accident occurs in aviation or in perfusion are when? Beginning and the end. Beginning and the end, the takeoff and the landing, the initiation or the termination of bypass. Those are the most crucial times. As we're gonna learn today though, we can't be lulled to sleep in that flying zone. Any of you ever flown a plane, you get up there, you keep the keep the horizon on level and you keep the needle fairly between the two things, you, the plane kind of flies itself. Perfusion <coughs> is that way to some extent, but it's much, much more terrifying, the, the, tra the maintenance phase of, of perfusion. So we talked about uh, the safety devices with initiation sequences and similar to aviation, we talked about checklists. One of the things that, whether you're a pilot, whether you're a perfusionist, being prepared for that moment. Being prepared, having your heater cooler on, having your gases on, having your clamps where they need to be. Knowing that sequence inside and out to, to initiate bypass is gonna make it so much safer and it's gonna make you uh, the difference between a good perfusionist and a great perfusionist. <coughs> now we're gonna talk about the maintenance phase. So now we're on, everything's gone well. What is kind of the first thing that starts the maintenance phase? What happens that kind of creates full bypass? The surgeon's gonna have you drop your flow, and what's he gonna do? He's gonna put something on. The cross clamp, right? He's gonna put the cross clamp on. That is telling us, okay, now's the time to go. When that cross clamp goes on, we immediately want to run what? Jordana? Anagrade cardioplegia. The anagrade cardio cardioplegia is gonna stop the heart. It's gonna create cardiac acquiescence, correct? When we run anagrade cardioplegia, what do we want to have off today? Caveat. We the, the anagrade vent. We have to have the anagrade vent off because that anagrade vent is wide into our anagrade cardioplegia. If we had that anagrade vent on, everything we would be given into that aorta would just be coming right back up through the, through the anagrade vent. What our goal is to build up a pressure in that ascending aorta to drive flow down through the coronaries and that flow is our cardioplegia. It's creating that electrolyte imbalance with high dose potassium into the cardiac muscle through the coronary anatomy into the cardiac muscle to stop the heart itself. Everybody with me so far? What's the flow on that? Like two, or the three, flow four, can be seven. variable depending on the size of the aorta of the anagrade and it's pressure based. We want to have enough flow that we create a high enough pressure, maybe 180, 200, in the root of the aorta to shut that aortic valve so that the blood flow doesn't go through the aortic valve, it goes into the coronaries. It's that less, flow's different for each person, less, maybe three or 400 cc's a minute. Less than a liter a minute. It's probably less than a liter a minute. That's different than when we run or, uh, retrograde cardioplegia, where our flow, we may have two, 300 cc's a minute, but we are basing our flow on that coronary sinus pressure. Anybody know what a good coronary sinus pressure is? 40. 40, 40. Not above 50 for sure. If we can keep it around that 40 mark, good. We want to see a slow incline build up that pressure in the, in the coronary sinus so it drives flow. What do we need, Keely? What do we need on when we run our retrograde cardioplegia? Then what do we need to turn on with that? Our, our integrate vent. 
If we don't, Adam, what happens eventually if we're running a lot of retrograde over a period of time and we don't have that vent on? The pressure in the aorta is going to build up to an inordinate amount, which could cause a dissection or something of that nature with those cannulas right there, correct? So when we run retrograde cardioplegia, we want to have the antigrade vent then on. That's how the vent works in conjunction with those two different cardioplegias. Now, maintenance of, cardio, uh, of uh, bypass, this phase. One of the really common things we need to be thinking about is documentation, charting. We're going to try to capture everything happens. When is the most appropriate time to chart? Whenever there's not something major going on, right? We never want the charting to steal our attention from what it is that we're actually doing. That being said, anytime you have any kind of an event, whether it's a major event or a minor event, go ahead and make a note of it. Also get used to charting on fairly incremental times. Like I like to chart on even numbers, uh, maybe every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes and every event. Why? Why not just every so often? I want it to make sure that I'm checking everything throughout the whole room and, and everything kind of in my domain on rarely uh, incremental, on fairly, uh, fairly common increments. Like every 10 minutes, I want to make sure that I've gone through and I've charted and documented each individual thing. It's kind of a reminder to me to do those things, but I never want to see anybody picking up the chart when you're given antigrade and you're turning the antigrade back. We don't need to juggle things. You can, you can go back and, and chart those things uh, afterwards. Now there's electronic charting, which takes some of that out of our hands and has given us a continuous record. So documentation is a really important part of the maintenance procedure. What is another major part of maintenance that we had another lab on a couple weeks ago? We, are, we built them into this system today. The shunts, right? There are two main fundamental types of shunts. There's kind of the normal shunt, which is a shunt that takes blood from our arterial line and returns it back into our reservoir. Some examples of just the normal shunts that we employ are our sample purge line, our recirc line for safety and priming and things, and our hemoconcentrator. Those are th the three that we're gonna concentrate on right now. What is a, kind of an abnormal shunt is the cardioplegia. Why is that abnormal? I know we talked about this. We had an essay question on it. It's a shunt, meaning it's pulling blood from the oxygenated uh, port, uh, our oxygenated our arterial line, but it's not returning it directly back into our bucket. It's actually going through the patient and eventually coming back into circulation. The other thing that makes the cardioplegia different is we have an actual regulated flow that tells us exactly what the flow is going through that shunt. And we talked about how we could kind of measure volumes through that shunt with, and how it changes between the two pumps, the centrifugal pump versus the roller pump setup. Um, not picked on. Brittany, talk to me about shown flow, measured flow on a pump, and uh, and effective flow to the patient, and how they differ, and, and why that's important. Um, they're different because if you have a shown flow, um, if the shunt is further from where it's measuring, it'll be a different flow going into the patient. Right, which is important. Why? Because we can be lulled to sleep thinking what? Okay. That our effective flow is normal because that's the same as our measured flow, even though in fact it's not going to the patient and we may be below on index. Everybody get that? So our measured or shown flow on our pump, if our uh, flow probe or with the roller pump, it's right on the pump, is proximal to all of our shunts, it's very different than our effective flow going to the patient. Our effective flow is what's going to keep the brain and the body alive. And if those things are different, we need to account for that. It's one of the things that I'm going to be watching for you today. Uh, I'm going to be asking you from a surgeon perspective, saying, hey, turn your cardioplegia on. Turn, you know, turn this vent off. Turn, the, turn your hemoconcentrator on. Go ahead and take off the I'm going to be asking you those things. But I'm also going to be observing you from a clinical perfusion instructor. Are you, do you have a good cognitive uh, idea of what effective flow is? So if I'm asking you to run those shunts, are you compensating with your flow to increase your effective flow to the patient? That's imperative. We talked about why that's so important and why that's vital into what we do. We need to know the amount of flow going through our whole system, but we also need to know the amount of flow going to our patients. So we're gonna work on the maintenance part. In fact, what I think we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and have you initiate. I'm not gonna be grading you on the initiation phase today. We already did that. But I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead and initiate just for practice so you get things going. Then I'm going to communicate with you and say, when, are you ready 
If you're to that point where you're ready, I'm gonna have you then drop your flow. Dropping your flow is gonna indicate what are we gonna do? What am I gonna put on? Dropping your flow. Drop, when I say you're gonna drop the flow, we just talked about it, what are we gonna put on? Uh, the flow meter. The cross clamp. Oh. We are gonna put the cross clamp on. That is gonna be your signal. When I say, okay, drop the flow, maintenance, the maintenance phase has started. We're gonna go through it like this. We're not gonna run cardioplegia for five minutes or three minutes, but we're gonna establish it. We're gonna talk about it through the vet. We're, I'm gonna see if you're compensating on the shunts. I'm gonna have you uh, measure those different things and go through maintenance. Go ahead. Um, in, in, in the clinic, is that is that a surgeon, um, like, I don't wanna say command, but is that a surgeon instruction? Like, um, Turn your flow down, drop no, your flow. Integrate. So when, they, when they're cross clamp off, they'll tell you when they wanna integrate. So if it's you, not really up to you. To if you go to work with a surgeon and you're a student and you haven't worked together a lot, they will tell you each command that you need to know. Your cross clamp's on, run integrate. Off, run retrograde. And once you've worked with the surgeon for a long period of time, you may get a thing where they give you a, a circle in the air. You, they may say flow down, they may expect you to hit, listen for the cricket clamp of that cross clamp. They, then they expect you, all right, bring your flow back up, run anti-grade, run it for two minutes, turn your vent on. When you're done with that, tell me, we're gonna run retro and turn, turn your vent off. Once you work with somebody like that, they like to then focus on what they're doing and not have to constant relay. But at the start, when you're building up, when you're getting to know somebody, they will make those commands and they will tell you and expect you to repeat or parrot those back to them to hear. So, any other questions? But when you see the, the reservoir level going up, you just turn all your, your hemoconcentric, it, it's not a surgeon who's gonna tell you, right? When you see, you, that you, surgeons may not ever tell you to go ahead and hemoconcentrate. It may okay. just be a standing order. Today, I'm gonna tell you probably, go ahead and open your hemoconcentrator because I'm gonna be observing how you do that and, and things like that. But yeah, a surgeon most likely are not gonna, they're not gonna give you little commands about your circuit, that's for you to know. Uh, but that's why we're going through this practice today. So, any other questions? All right, let's go. Two different, uh, two different pumps.